Um, this program uh, and its history of five years has been so exciting to follow that I was thrilled to be invited to be part of this chain of um, extremely um, provocative and imaginative ways of staging practice. And uh, so I decided also that I didn't want to be alone in this attempt. Um, and so I was thrilled when um, my friend, um, an excellent percussionist, um, also studied music in, in, in very different sort of aspects from theory uh, as well at SOAS, um, that he agreed to be part of this exercise with me this evening, Sarathi Korvar. Um, and we're going to go through, in this sense, a sort of my curatorial um, methodology as part of this project called the Museum of Rhythm. And Sarthi is going to intervene with his practice and certain aspects of notation and scoring, um, the use of the metronome, um, and also expand on his uh, album that actually released today um, called Day to Day. So um, I'm going to start by uh, discussing this figure um, that many of you may know, um, the French Marxist philosopher and sociologist Henri Lefebvre, who was exploring space-time structures in society as well as the impact on everyday life on the body and its metabolic condition. I feel he would highly approve of an event in a space like this and study its rhythms intimately. He worked throughout the 20th century and thought of the individual and the communal realm becoming enmeshed and when we consider his theories, they work as perhaps a flexible architecture meant for social use. Towards the end of Lefebvre's life, he began to think about the future of the city and wrote an essay which he called The Elements of Rhythm Analysis. And this was the part that um, stayed with me. These studies marked a, re a return to his interests during the interwar years, revolving around a theory of moments expanding upon what Henry Bergson, how he studied duration, and a poetics of spatiality, but more importantly, even a political use of rhythm as a comprehensive methodology in understanding the structural conditions of modernity itself, the organic and mechanized pulse that mobilizes today's human condition. I got particularly interested in rhythm analysis as this was not simply proposed as a theory, but rather as a potential subject and a tool of analysis whose functional realm needed to be considered speculatively through various disciplines, through the inhabitation of living morphologies, yet also the inhabitation of rule-bound systems and of fiction in order to be implemented. Lefebvre even projects a symbolic protagonist who he calls the rhythm analyst, and it was a search operation to begin to bring this figure to life. This figure who deploys the body as a metronome, such that inner and outer vibratory characteristics, circulation patterns of the world, may be approached comparatively, measured, and plotted. Rhythm analysis may thereby be considered a form of intersubjective writing and acting at the mouth of time. The metronome, since it's a key figure for Lefebvre, I thought, come to that. And extend the idea of the body as a tuning instrument. The birth of the metronome, as we know, was thought of in terms of the regimentation of time, its militarization into the deadening beat, the regulation managed by an automated time machine external to the body's intuitive timekeeping, and essentially involving a human apparatus alliance to maintain a pulse as external record. It wasn't, though, until the 19th century that a Dutchman, who isn't credited much, uh, Dietrich Nicolaas Winkel, in Amsterdam found uh, that a double-weighted pendulum would emanate low tempos even when constructed at a short length. And this portability of the metronome is what made it this excessively used device of timekeeping, which also, sh also shared the timeline of other small gadgets that 
began to permit rhythm management in society. Do we see it? Okay. Yeah? Okay, I'll just show you the previous. This, this is what I was speaking to initially. That was my introduction slide. Okay. Um. However, rather than just this sort of simple um, history of evoking the metronome, I, want, I became more interested to follow the experimental practices of composers and artists who chose to disavow the mechanical pulse of the metronome in some way or the other while still using it as a compositional device. So these are pieces that you all may be familiar with. Um, Georgi Ligeti's 1962 performance piece, Poem Symphony for 100 Metronomes, which was produced during his brief connection with the Fluxus group, but still circulates and people keep revisiting this piece and that's what constantly brings it alive in the cultural sphere. But beginning from 10 performers with these 100 metronomes being wound up, being charged, and then slowly from a collective simultaneity becoming a slow dwindling ramble um, was something that also reminded me of this pulse of industrialization and its heavy beats that then go out of tune and disseminate in society and fail and, and crash at some point or the other. Um, and I enjoyed how the, how Ligeti um, eventually personalizes the metronome ensemble as an oral counterpoint. And then you have the avant-garde musician Toshi Ishianagi, who made the music for an electronic metronome in 1960. Um, and he was, of course, very close to Yoko Ono and uh, Lamont Young. Um, and also he was the one who did um, the International Graphic Scores exhibition in 1962 in Tokyo that John Cage attended. I think these are all quite um, interesting in parallel to the fact that um, Mario Garcia Torres's great show um, uh, on Kanlan Nankuro is, is up now. It's a work that I'm very fond of, so I feel like I'm sort of also speaking in tune with, with that exhibition at this point. Um, Ishinagi was special because he considered within the metronome how a certain indeterminacy could be staged, which was essentially c countering the very form of this device. And he enjoyed framing compositions through a sense of in-betweenness or betweenness itself, which was called ma in J uh, Japanese. It's a special word for betweenness as a characteristic. Um, and he he used number sequences and chants um, for, for the electronic metronome composition. In, in terms of somehow bringing these together, um, I was thinking of this quote um, by Nabokov, which is in one of his novels, where he says, maybe the only thing that hints at a sense of time is rhythm, not the recurrent beats of rhythm, but the gap between two such beats, the gray gap between the black beats, the tender interval. And now I'm going to ask Sarthi um, to play. Uh, he's going to consider composition in relation to the metronome and circadian rhythms. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, it's great to be here. And I'd like to thank Natasha for letting me share the stage with her. Um, I'm going to start off with playing a piece that's inspired actually by um, uh, the metronome and um, a similar idea. I mean, I think as personally as a musician, uh, going through music school or anybody who's had the similar experience would probably say the same thing is that you kind of start with um, you're introduced to the metronome as this foreign instrument and you, you 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 start hating it but then you slowly sort of learn to love it and learn to play with it and you're told to kind of play with it rather than against it and uh, I think then of course given the kind of personality you have you kind of then um, choose to you know use it or not use it but I think this piece of music that I've kind of composed is um, is very, in a sense, you've, you've kind of said it, in the sense that it uh, it talks of the kind of human error as, as being very beautiful in relation to this kind of very ultra-disciplined idea of rhythm that doesn't exist for me anyway in, in, in the way humans kind of interpret rhythm. Um, 
It's called Indefinite Leave to Remain. And it's, it's also inspired by uh, Steve Reich and you know his kind of ideas of multiple patterns playing at the same time simultaneously crisscrossing each other. Okay. <laughs> Leave now.
What does it mean to even conceive the Museum of Rhythm, um, especially naming something as such? For that matter, how to consider the museum as a verb, as a doing, a way of bringing into being? And this, this was where I started to think at first. The speculative museum, which I've called the Museum of Rhythm, relating to Lefebvre's rhythm analysis, comes alive when you choose to animate it. For the first time, it was within a Biennale in Taipei. Soon it will be manifesting in Poland, in Łódź, within a museum that has a collection of modern and contemporary art that investigates these cyclical aspects of time, that looks at um, architecture as well as an uh, artifact of time constructs and every now and then it materializes through word image associations and through evenings like this and otherwise it's something that stays in my mind as well that sort of resides there and I think of the museum as a forum for the blind spot of master narratives and its surpluses that which exceeds normative history and that which remains unsayable, but also subaltern to a centralizing argument. Perhaps the museum can be considered a montage of affects, a site of unveiling modernity as we have come to accept it, rather than continually reaffirming its dominant strangleholds. It also doesn't necessarily have to be a site of accumulating time, but rather encompass a clash of times incapable of moving in a singular direction called progress and therefore it may be conceived with another sort of vector that is web-like. I was inspired by this clock um, which comes from the 12th century um, by a, a scientist historian called Al Jazari and he wrote this manuscript on wondrous devices and machines um, and Basically, um, also the Greek term for water clock, klepsidra, literally means to steal water or water thief. As the earliest timekeeping devices, water clocks assumed contrasting forms in different parts of the world, yet all measured time flows with a certain leaking vessel, be it an earthen bowl or the complicatedly geared elephant clock of Al Jazari. The rhythmic intermittence of time was gauged as a sequence of programmatic departures and replenishments, a liquid time that must be released in order to exist. And those fugitive rivers of time, are they the pa pages of history or its unchronicled interstices? In the elephant clock that we see here, a mahath ridden elephant in whose insides are a water tank containing a perforated bowl and an intricate pulley system. Upon the elephant's back is the visible timekeeping complex. The change of hour is noted by a zodiac dial presided by a falcon, while a seated scribe records the passage of minutes. In addition, a two-headed serpent operates as a looped delivery mechanism to lend and receive instructions of water time. Finally, informing the Mahath to beat a symbol on the elephant's head, sounding the half hour. The inner chambers of these creatures thus function as channels for temporal transmission. But what of their thirst? Trapped within a structural hierarchy, the serpent is not permitted to perceive the opposing currents of time, only a measured swallowing. As for the elephant, he must ride in an assigned direction to move forward. The defining authority and control of space has generally been attributed to humanity. However, time was thought to belong to the realm of divinity until it was captured by a universally accepted measure of clocks, so not clocks like this one, that become obsolete, that become imaginative animal dreams. Within the seismic contemporaneity that we are in, the imaginative potential of telling time may no longer lie in minor dissections of petrified chronicles, but in reconsidering the entirety of its sensual complex, the rhythm of history. 
I now want to make this sort of comparison between occult and industrial examples that disseminated um, during modernity as 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 um, as forms in which psychic cartographies and future technocracy could reside together. So these are books that I saw um, when I was quite young. Um, actually, Sarthi and I we both went to this special school that was initiated by a philosopher educator called Krishnamurthy, um, and the school where he was was on the grounds of what was called the Theosophical Society in Chennai in South India. And the Theosophical Society, which which actually exists all over the world, is is a very special place, and it had a very very specific connection um, to psyche, to internationalism, to a certain kind of solid, uh, solidarity network that at the same time was also deeply colonial and troubled. Um, and so I became quite fascinated by the forms that were produced by, um, by this society that existed as a world society in a way. Um, and so um, this particular book is The Chakras, which is, um, as you see in the next so th this is by Lead Peter. Um, it shows the chakras across the body, but in this sense, they were also um, imagined devices um, to further uh, the mission of parapsychology, to study the body as a medium. In 1901, Annie Besson and Lead Peter published a little book titled Thought Forms that contained notes and drawings on observed forms, also called vibration figures in an essay appearing within the same publication. It is hence a book that considers thought as fields of visual energy and transient objects. Believing in the nature of matter lies beyond the grasp of scientific instruments and the theosophists um, urge modern society to glance further afield. Beyond the known physical world, while this composed certain dangers of clairvoyance that pose the ability to read the auras of the greater cosmos and certain figures were noble and others, as you see, were considered savage. There still remained something charismatic and you have quotes like this, to paint in the earth's dull colors, the forms clothed in the living light of other worlds is a hard and thankless task. So much the more gratitude is due to those who have attempted it the theosophists. They needed colored fire and had only ground earths. So there's this narrative of moving towards the celestial realm, thinking about the body as an astral plane, etc. But around the same time, you also have this. Um, this is actually the display at the Museum of Rhythm. So to say that it, it really did exist and just to say one tiny part of it, what it looked like. Um, which was this gathering of documents. Um, around the time of the Theosophists, but also around earlier, a little bit earlier, um, the time of the horse-drawn wagon, Frank B. Gilbreth and Lillian M. Gilbreth were beginning elaborate experiments in time-motion study by turning the laboring body into a measurable entity to pursue the one best way to work. For the National Conference on the Western Efficiency Society in 1917, they authored a pamphlet titled Measurement of the Human Factor in Industry and through it proclaimed the measurement on machines that are obsolete is of little value. Measurement of human beings is valuable forever. Half a century earlier, the Victorian polymath Francis Galton had made a similar claim to popularize anthropometry and eugenics. Between 1910 and 2000, uh, sorry, 1924, the Gilberts operated as a consulting firm that studied effort versus fatigue, tiredness and exhaustion being the enemy, and instituted the most efficient work motions for a range of professions from bricklaying to typing, fencing to surgery. I want to play a short clip now.
So these are some of the films that the Gilberts made that documented their methods. And they have the normal method, which was the traditional way in which a certain task was done. And then the Gilbert method that you see here, which was supposed to be more economical motion. And this is how human society got trained at this advanced level to perform the body in a certain kind of way as a laboring device. So it goes on like this. It's pretty ruthless. <laughs> These are a selection of Gilbreth chronocyclographs which were presented in the Museum of Rhythm to expose snapshots of motion paths formed by small electronic lamps usually fastened to workers' hands or fingers. Long exposures to a chain of light circuits turn bodies into incandescent streaks or a frenzy of scratches on a plate of darkness. The luminosity of a golfer's swing and hand drill operator thus come to share resemblance with the display of the theosophical body aura diagrams. Though, though these materials are fundamentally incompatible, both study corporeal potential as a flow of sensations to be disciplined into higher forms be it through the problematic principles of clairvoyance or the scrupulous ordering of workers' motions, whether they be female typists or the surgeon's hand, the latter involves a total mechanization of the body to operate it as a tool of efficiency, while the former treats the body, the flesh, as inferior receiver of an idealized astral body. I'm just going to run through some of the other um, practices that were shown in the Museum of Rhythm and as certain sorts of method methodologies of composition, of notation, and performativity. This particular work of um, Simon Forti, um, who all of you know, um, I find really a fantastic example of rhythm analysis itself, where she, I'm going to read her words, where she says in Contact Quarterly, a choreography um, journal, a dance and choreography journal, she says in 1986, I've been dancing the news, talking and dancing, becoming the ships, the land, the peoples, the strategies, the connections. She starts to collect the International Herald Tribune from wherever part of the world she is, and she slowly starts to cannibalize the headlines. She turns them into lyrics. She turns them into grunts and um, indecipherable sounds. She starts to eat the newspaper, she starts to absorb it, she starts to turn it into dance moves. Um, and in this way, uh, there there becomes no separation between the, the news entering her mind and the news becoming a body itself. Um, it's, it's a practice of, pra it's a practice and performance form that helps me remember the bits and the broad strokes of information that I take in from the news media. And as I run it all through my body, I can see how it falls together in my mind, in my imagination, in my feeling. We also showed um, the LA, ar LA artist Shana Horvitz, um, whose work only get, got to become quite famous um, after she, when she was very old and then when she passed away. Um, Shana used graphic uh, notational language through mathematical processes as rules to create abstract visuality. The axis of a graph as a form of grammar for drawing and let's say even choreographing movement. In the case of Horvitz, she called these sonakinatographies starting as early as 1968, capturing sound motion as form of notation. This word has all three. A minimalist evocation that remains unique in a male-dominated Californian scene. The liberation within sequentiality and the literal reshaping of geometry as optic narration. 
The formulation of rules as exercises in language creation and patterns of measurement, in a sense, these are also algorithmic diagrams of what became later data mapping. But it possesses a new age sensibility that marks the time of the artist. She says the need, she had the need to compose and control time while working with it through a deductive logic. This is a more, um, sorry, this is a more recent work um, by a young artist called Samson Young um, in Hong Kong. Um, and he works with opera. So he's also a trained composer uh, and a conductor. And these scores for me were also quite interesting as they capture um, historic firearms and use the weapon as an instrument um, in a sense of destruction, but also of scoring composing an archive of violence where the double language of sounding is denoted. Young's manual transcriptions of those same war sounds turn into graphical scores that, to, that are performed then further as, um, as, as, as a sort of field of weaponry. He starts to use physical, um, everyday uh, um, objects to transform them into this operatic uh, performance around uh, rereading his own graphic scores. In a sense, he's evoking um, the American Ghost Army um, during the Second World War and its 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 deceptions around um, around the sonic aspect of the of the battlefield as well. This is another artist um, who you all would be familiar with here. Um, I would know probably less um, Gerhard Rum, but he's a favorite of mine. A great pianist, composer, um, of course, also the one of the founding members of the Wiener Gruppe. But this particular um, collage composition was something that hadn't been shown before um, we, we added it to the Museum of Rhythm. It, it's called Rund, and he made it from the 1950s all the way through to 1998. So it sort of stayed with him for decades as he tried to make this composition um, using found images. In Rund, we travel from the moon's surface into an escalator tunnel. James Bond's gun barrel, a hula hoop, an enormous leaking stomach, a tennis court, and onwards into what appears a mine shaft. Room's photocolor series, made across five decades, bear the sensibility of a graphic score that mediates conditions of roundness, articulations of circuits, cycles, spheres, revolutions, the status of thinking as acts of spinning around. The circle comes to serve as an elemental habitat, but also a passage, a reminder that the whole can no longer be portrayed as a large round hole. Instead, there is an observation of the thing via circumambulation. I'm, this is um, a score that Sarthi sent to me, and he's now going to play his notation. Okay, not his notation. It's my photograph. Okay, it's photograph. <laughs> uh, yeah, this score is actually by um, one of my favorite drummers and percussionists, a person called Billy Martin, who plays with, like, maybe some of you know, Medeski Martin and Wood, this, like, jazz funk band. Don't know. Anyway. Um, and it's based on insect rhythms and bug music. And uh, Billy Martin's been really inspired by uh, and has written a whole sort of array of compositions based on insect music and uh, this particular score is meant to be played um, by either one soloist or by six people and um, yeah I think that's it.
another aspect that um, I was looking into for the Museum of Rhythm um, were maps. Um, and this was explored through the practice of uh, Eric Beltran, whose work is also actually shown here um, in a show that Boris did. Um, and Eric was looking at maps um, not as the flat representations of territory, but in fact as machines of dimensional movement, um, as tactile languages. He was looking at maps that needed to be felt as sculptural devices or, or as um, that maps that were sung. Or uh, I'm going to give you examples of these sort of maps within, within cultures um, that became transmitted as haptic uh, tools uh, to read place. And, and in certain, how in certain mythical formations and spiritual keys, these maps are visual transporters from, from, as I said, one dimension to the other and as projection sites to, make, to allow the mind to make a leap. Um, in Eric Beltran's map of maps, so you see these, this large, this is not a great picture for this screen, but this sort of this flow to ceiling charts that he made, that he looked as, as, as a map of maps. Um, so there were about 3,000 examples in there. Um, and he chose, for instance, uh, the shell of a turtle as one example on which he then built this composition of imaging the world um, through the, the shell of a turtle. And how that happened was that actually the shell of a turtle um, for Beltran says for the Delaware Indians of North America and in Asian cosmogony, the earth rests on the back of the turtle. And further, the turtle also begins to symbolize the earth itself. Moreover, through his diagrammatic constellation, we also get to know that the turtle frequently recurs as a divine symbol of a long life, of uh, an animal that carries a certain world of knowledge on its back. It also served as a moon calendar and proto I Ching in China. The Romans emulated its morphology and movements in battle formations with shields. As Zeno um, says that even in, in the ancient paradoxes, even Achilles never managed to take over the turtle. There is a Chinese legend which mentions that a family when trapped in a cave for several years was able to survive by observing and mimicking the posture of a turtle that was trapped in the cave with them. That is yet another wonderful episode visualized in Beltran's research on the turtle emerging as a life force and as a force of rhythm. Um, another example uh, from the museum is the work of Lawrence Abu Hamdan, it's an artist from Lebanon, lived for, uh, for a long time in London where he was working with forensic architecture um, and looking at the politics of listening and how how the voice is plotted by state systems, how the voice becomes surveilled and how identity is constantly regimented um, uh, th through the role of the voice. He has he has this archival project that I'm going to talk about, but this one example, so you're probably curious, that this lion, this is the famous um, lion of MGM. So um, the roaring lion uh, of MGM was the first non-musical sound to be copyrighted in 1928 um, for the talking movies. And, and though it was plotted as one lion, it was actually seven lions that roared um, on, on that MGM symbol. This was something that would belong to Lawrence's oral, um, oral contract um, audio archive. Lefebvre also talks about um, bodily rhythms and socializing of the self. He talks about a hierarchy of gesture and mimetic tendencies framing a dominant world of being in a dominant mode of being in the world. And it is through an economy of bodies brought into a prescribed rhythm that time regimes of enculturation processes and civiliza civilizational enterprise proliferate. Lefebvre points out in his writings um, on how humans break themselves in like animals through a set of consecrated rites of presenting ourselves and presenting others to the world, dressage, whether used for horses, or in Lefebvre's case, he uses it on humans, reduces unforeseen behavior to thrust us into de deterministically rhythmized beings. 
Our bodies, those like animals, are found to have use value only when they are broken in or trained to operate in this way. The untrained body becomes the defiant aberration. This is important in relation to how Lawrence constructs um, his archive uh, because he he's looking um, at juridical listening, at how the law interprets the role of the voice. In his archive, he has the trials of Saddam, but also those of Judas Priest. He has UK police tapes, um, but also Italo Calvino's A King Listens. And so it's this accumulating site in which the relationship to listening is investigated through storytelling, through borders, through human rights, through testimony, and through international law. It's also a, vo a voice-activated archive, so you have to, the, the audience had to ask for a certain recording to play from the archive and had a keyword that they had to say. Um, and in this sense, it's also the procedure of uh, of, of, of asking um, asking the law of vocally testifying um, to the archive in this case. This is a piece um, by the same artist that we actually had on the floor. So I wanted to think about if there is a museum of rhythm, then how do we activate the floor of this museum? How could it have also um, a sonic print running through it. Um, so these are two different words, sorry, two different uh, voice prints um, saying the word you. And this is how accent analysis takes place um, through police uh, investigations. Um, at depending, of course, then on your accent, you have a certain level of treatment um, by the state security force. But this is just you know as simple as the word you, where the minute the voice leaves you, it's it's not simply yours. It's 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 within that web of signification that places it in the vulnerability of state systems. And I'm actually gonna um I'm actually gonna end uh, with two things before Sarsi takes over um for for slightly longer. Um, this is a map uh, by the geographer Herman Moll, um, made in 1736 which was the first map, if I'm not mistaken, um, of an, which is called the new map of the whole world with trade winds. Um, and this, I, f I feel, should be the concluding um, image for, 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 for our uh, presentation today. Because I wonder, I, when I saw this map, um, and, and Moll is the same one who made these sort of more fanciful cartographies for the book, uh, book uh, in, uh, covers uh, uh, of for Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe and Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travel. So he also made fantasy maps, but then he 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 was the first to make this map of the trade winds of the world. And if a map of winds is not is that not also a wind composition in some sense? The irrational pursuit of unplottable markings of currents dwelling across land and sea that never stall and never allow to be fully measured, to be possessed and accountable as image. It's only through, for me, a device like the Museum of Rhythm that I can think of this score for trading empires, colonial territorial pockets in the tone of wind pressure arrows piercing the belly of a world atlas. Uh, I'm not going to play um, just, sorry, so that was the last thing, but I'm also going to play a clip, actually. Um, it's from a film by Jean, Jean Rouge. Um, the Battery is Dogon, which was made in 1965. Uh, and he... Ooh, is this the one? Sorry, no. Um, and here Rouge is, uh, is, is plotting... He's making a rhythmical film in which he um, captures the stone drum music um, of the Dogon and also dance.
Thank you. Um, so I, pl I also played this in relation to the fact that Sarthi did this fascinating research field trip um, and uh, recordings that are exceptional um, with the Siddhi community who are the um, African diaspora in India and also in parts of Pakistan. And he worked with uh, their kinds of instrumentation and created his album, yeah. which he's not going to talk about. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, so I worked with this community of people called the Siddhis, who are, uh, like she said, diasporic uh, communities in India and Pakistan, uh, African communities, who basically immigrated from as far back as the 8th century uh, from the east, from East Africa mostly, but also from Southern Africa. And the term Siddhi is now used to as a blanket term for anybody who immigrated from from Africa in general, so it's essentially very difficult to place where people are from anymore, uh, which is which is really sad. But uh, so it is. Um, I spent about two weeks uh, with a particular group of performing musicians uh, on the western coast of India in a in a small village called Ratanpur, which is in Gujarat, which is where we're both from actually, um, not the village but Gujarat, <laughs> and. Um, it was an amazing experience for me because they're a, a fascinating community of people, obviously because of their heritage, but also because uh, from a from a more selfishly sort of musical angle, uh, a lot of their instrumentation is informed by a lot of the instrument instrumentation that you find in uh, lots of communities in the on the eastern coast of Africa. So there are these musical bows that they play, which are like. Um, gourd resonated bows and mouth bows that you find everywhere across you know from west africa to east africa to southern africa and they exist like out of nowhere on the western coast of india that these community just play these instruments and nowhere else do you find musical bows in india um, and the particular musical bow that they play is called the malunga um, and it's amazing because obviously when you hear it i'm going to play a couple of samples of the field recordings that i made they're distinctly indian but also you can hear, I mean, the, if anybody's heard like the berimbau or any, an, any mouth bow or just stick bows, uh, you, you'll know that, you know, there's a resemblance there, there's a parallel uh, relationship there. समरुख सुधरे मन का मेलार समरुख सुधरे मन का मेलार नबी जी रे अल्लाह हो नबी Allah ho nabi ji Allah ho nabi ji re He nabi ji nabi ji 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 Allah ho nabi ji re Ram Rahim ta me Ek kari jano lala Ek kari jano मिट जाए चौरासी का फेरा रे मिट जाए चौरासी का फेरा रे नबी जी रे
अल्लाह नबी जी तुम ही हो नबी जी के समरुख सुधरे मन का मेला रे समरुख सुधरे मन का मेला रे नबी जी रे अल्लाह हो नबी Yeah, so like as you can see, it's it's an incredible uh, sort of mixture of influences, and uh, some of the words that they sing, not in this particular recording, but some of the words they sing are in Swahili, and they don't know what they're saying because it's an oral tradition that's passed down through the ages. You know, your forefathers teach you the songs, and when you ask them what these words mean, they say we don't know. Like you know. they just part of the songs that we've learned so it's incredible i mean it's a fascinating community of people and i mean i was very privileged to kind of spend any time with them and so i guess what i'm going to do now is <laughs> play a couple of songs that i made an entire album based around these field recordings and it's kind of this in the vein of uh, sort of spiritual jazz free jazz recording underneath these albums and it's, it features an entire band a five piece band and i'm now going to attempt to play one of those songs by myself so wish me luck <laughs> so this song also features some um mouth bows from southern africa and the malunga
so I don't know. I can keep going all night so like somebody's got to tell more. me to stop at some some point yeah play, play one, one more. more like uh, maybe play like this one of the songs just play one of the songs I think it'll be nice. cool i think what i'll do is i'll play one field recording and then the song mm -hmm. that's okay <laughs> So this is by a person called Salim Gulam Mohammed Siddi, who is one of the performing musicians in the troupe that I was telling you about. Um, this is special because it was rec it was recorded on the banks of the river Narmada, which is quite a highly politicized river in India, and we kind of grew up with uh, the Narmada being in the news a lot, wasn't it? And uh, it's a beautiful river where a lot of people, you know, consider their home, but it's also a river that's kind of uh, been at the center of a lot of development and a lot of large dams and a lot of displacement and uh, I'd never seen the river before and it was just the first time I'd seen the river in person and uh, we found this abandoned boat where we sat by the river and recorded this song so yeah. and actually the lyrics are very interesting because he says he's kind of telling God he's saying you know you better do your job because if you don't do your job who will do it who who who's there to do it you know so you better do your you better do your part of the i suppose your part of the of the of the agreement in some sense this is great गरीब नवाज या गरीब नवाज मोरे ख्वाज जी कर्म करना सरकार कर्म करना सरकार कर्म की बारी आई है कर्म करना सरकार कर्म की बारी आई है कर्म तुम ना करोगे तो कर्म कौन करेगा कर्म तुम ना करोगे तो कर्म कौन करेगा तुम्हारे सिवा मेरी खाली झोली कौन भरेगा वो कर्म कर मोरे को जो
Thank you. 